after this short um, marketing interlude, let's come back uh, to the next talk. And I'm very, very happy that uh, the talk organizer group managed to get another outside uh, outside person to submit a talk. And I'm very happy to announce Jennifer Blatz. Uh, she will talk about how to keep cognitive biases from keeping into your design and professional relationships. Uh, she's a lead user experience designer and researcher with expertise that lends itself to any industry. So this is not just focused on software development. Jen's path to UX started in journalism and graphic design, where she learned the importance of aesthetics, organization and catering content for the consumer. She's worked in a number of fields, and I'm very happy to have her here for our conference this year. So enjoy the talk from Jennifer Blatz. Welcome, welcome to the NEOS conference. I hope you're doing well. Uh, today I'm going to talk about cognitive biases and how to keep them from creeping into your work. Since we're kind of tight on time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So let's start off by looking at a few images. I want you to think about what you see when you look at these images. What do you see here? How about this one? What do you see in this image? And what about this picture? Think about what you see here. I'm guessing that you saw a couple of things in these images, right? So what's going on here? Well, our mind tries to make us feel comfortable in the world around us as quickly as possible. Simply put, our mind plays tricks on us. And sometimes when our brain jumps to conclusions so quickly, like it did for us, it just makes stuff up that is wrong. So when you see a couple of things in one image, like here, maybe you see a bathtub that is upside down, but you also see some kind of animal-like figure with four legs in the air. This is called the pareidolia effect. And this is kind of a big word, so I'm going to say it twice so that you can feel comfortable with the pronunciation. The pareidolia effect is when people see patterns, inanimate objects, or subliminal messages in something else. For example, when you see a dog shape in the clouds, that's an example of the pareidolia effect. And that is an example of a, of a cognitive bias. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So very briefly, before I get into cognitive biases, let me tell you who I am. My name is Jen Blatz, and I'm a lead user experience researcher and designer in the United States. I also co-founded a used to be local to Dallas area meetup group, but is now inter international known as UX Research and Strategy. I would love for you to connect with our group, and we have many free events and events that are all virtual, so anyone around the world can attend. But okay, enough about me. Let's get back to the talk. So first, let me say that I do not come from a psychology background, and I think that this is really important to emphasize. I tell you this because I don't want you to worry that this is going to be a really stuffy or really highly academic talk. No, no, no. I also want you to understand that people outside of psychology, like UX designers, product owners, developers, website designers, engineers, and so on, we can benefit 
by knowing just a little bit about cognitive biases. Why? Because we all have them. What I hope to help you with today is to show you some ways to identify cognitive biases in yourself and in others. That really is the first step. Being aware of cognitive biases can help you keep them from creeping into your work, your conversations, and your relationships. So today I'm gonna to talk about a few things. First, I'm gonna give you a high level definition of what cognitive bias means. Then I'm gonna talk about what to look for in yourself and in others to recognize what a cognitive bias looks like. Then I'm gonna talk about what you can do to fight them off. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about some ways that you can use cognitive biases for good. Yes, you can use them to your advantage. So let's start with the basics. What is a cognitive bias? Well, according to Wikipedia, a cognitive bias is a systematic pattern of deviation from norm or rationality in judgment. Uh, what? <laughs> like I said before, it's a way the brain plays tricks on us by jumping to conclusions about the world around us. So it's, it's basically mental shortcuts. We can't help it. Our brain does this without us knowing. All right, so we know what it is. So why should we even care? We're not psychiatrists, right? Well, some of my, maybe some of us have been in the psychology field in a past life. I don't know, but I'm gonna guess that most of the people at the conference today are related to development, product, technology, or maybe UX design in some way. As a designer and a development professional, we probably have heard that it is important to test our designs with users. I'm guessing that some of you here are familiar with that process or have heard about it. And in doing so, we must be very careful not to bias our tests or to lead the witness. And when I say lead the witness, I mean asking questions in a biased way that might cause the person to answer questions then in a less genuine way than they actually would. So being aware of how you might do that, even if it is unintentional, is really a key to a successful usability test or when you're working with your team to try to solve a problem. If we can recognize cognitive bias could be a problem and we're aware of the signs, then we can fight that urge to go down that dark hole and we can help others from doing the same. So let's get started with looking at some types of biases that might creep into our professional world. Well, we might as well start with the most important person in the room, and that's you, that's me, that's ourself. We always think that we're immune to the problems and the flaws of others, don't we? Let's face it. So blind spot bias happens when we see ourselves as less biased than others. Also, we're displaying blind spot bias when we like to point out cognitive biases in others rather than ourselves. The key to know here is that everyone is affected by blind spot bias. Sure, people are motivated to view themselves in a positive light. That's natural. But to be honest, we're no better than everybody else. So what does blind spot bias look like? Well, one sign is that you do not accept feedback or advice from others. I have seen this so many times. Someone get their ego gets in the way at admitting they might not know something. So what can we do to prevent blind spot bias? Well, first, be aware it happens to everyone. Don't think of yourself as above the law or something special. In the technology world, if you're conducting some sort of research, maybe it's a usability test. I find it's helpful to write down your questions and tasks and have another person review it. Test your test and pilot your questions and tasks with another person on your team or a, another professional. And make sure that you take their advice on improvements 
and removing leading questions. If you find yourself resisting help, you might want to take another look at yourself, Mr. Blind Spot Bias. Okay, let's talk about another, another cognitive bias, which is known as the experimenter's bias. First, let me clarify, let me clarify something when I talk about an experimenter. And I'm not really talking about some official researcher, like a scientist or someone who's running an experiment like you see in this picture. I'm talking about anyone who is doing research with users or to gain an understanding about a product or they're interviewing other people or even when you're talking with your team or stakeholders to try to get information. I would consider us all an experimenter if we're having those kinds of conversations. So what happens with experimenter bias is the person is sharing, when they're sharing their findings with others, what they learn from these conversations, they tend to believe and share the information that agrees with what their expectations were. So in other words, they promote, about, they promote and they talk about things that went well in the conversation or the research study and maybe forgets to mention the disagreeable stuff. So let me tell you a story. I was participating in some research at a financial company and we were sitting around tables like you see here and each of us had a role. We had someone who was interviewing, we had note takers and the participant was sitting at the head of the table. So the participant was telling us about the last time she went to a dealership to buy a car. In the United States, we tend to go to a car dealership and buy a car there. So I'm not sure what it's like in Germany, but th they um, don't consider this to be a great experience generally because um, salespeople are pushy sometimes. Sometimes the process takes a really long time. So to buy a car, at least in the United States, is generally viewed as not very fun. So the participant was talking about the last time that she bought a car and it was less than fabulous. And one of the note takers on the team who was sitting next to me did not like what she was hearing from this participant. And instead of silently taking notes like she was supposed to be doing, she interrupted the participant and said, what? I've never heard anything like that happening at a dealership before. Are you sure that's what really happened? Oh, <laughs> Ooh, this behavior is wrong on so many levels. So how can we avoid the experimenter bias? Well, one way to avoid such bias behavior is to use people who are taking notes and conducting the research, who have little or no stake in the experiment. They don't have an interest in the outcome, a personal interest in the outcome. So they are likely not to affect the conversations through, their, through injecting bias because they might have a hidden agenda. But if a person on your team does have some involvement in the product and therefore some personal interest, or professional interest, make sure that you have clear rules and procedures in place for the research project. Remind that person that we are here to gather data and insights from our participants, not to share our own thoughts. Okay, so let's go one level deeper than the experimental bias and talk about the observer expectancy effect. So think about what I just told you in that story where they were like, are you sure that's what really happened? Think about how that behavior affected the participant, the rest of that interview. Yeah, I can assure you that it did. So the observer expectancy effect happens when the researcher or anyone who's in a conversation really, um, the one who's talking to the participant either and it may even be subconsciously or unintentionally, they react to something that the person has said or done. And then when this happens, the, the researcher's reactions affect the participant in the conversation. 
So what does this look like? Well, it could be a surprise facial expression, like when the participant gives a strange or a wrong answer. It can be noises, like when a participant makes a uh, wrong move, like uh, sighs or scoffs. Let me just tell you, this is bad, bad, bad. You don't want to do this. It does affect the participant. So please, if you're ever talking to customers or clients, stakeholders, partners on your team, and you're seeking their honest feedback and information, just think about how the observer expectancy effect could actually affect that conversation. So let me tell you another story. It was my first week on the job at a company that owns a bunch of animal hospitals. I was asked to sit in a focus group video call and they were gonna reveal a new design. So the product owner, we'll call him Dennis because that is his name. He addressed the crowd of 50, that's five, oh, 50 people on the call from veterinarian doctors to technicians, a number of people. Dennis said to his innocent bystanders, here is the design for the new communication screen. Isn't it great? What do you think? Oh, it all went dark for me after that. Isn't it great? What do you think? Dennis just stepped in a huge pile of observer expectancy bias. Oh. <laughs> needless, needless to say, that was the last time that type of focus group format and someone saying, isn't this great? That never happened again at the company on my watch. <laughs> As a designer or a developer, you want your design to succeed. I get it. You've poured your heart and your soul into what you've created. Maybe you've even pushed every little pixel in that perfect position. Then, when your design goes in front of a customer for testing and you see them struggle with what seems to be like the easiest thing on the planet, what are you supposed to do? You want to freak out. Well, you can't. But here's what you can do to avoid tainting the witness. Like I said before, if you can, get someone else to test your designs. Again, that other person is not emotionally invested, and therefore, they're much less likely to react to feedback that is not in line with what the designer wants. The major point I want to take you to take away from the observer expectancy bias is to keep your body language and your tone in check. You can even record yourself to see those subconscious clues that you might be giving off. This will help you become aware of your reactions and that can help you keep them in line. Okay, so we talked a lot about how you can detect cognitive bias in yourself. Now let's expand the idea a little bit and talk about cognitive biases and how they can affect how we perceive others compared to ourselves. So social comparison bias is the tendency to favor people who do not compete with our strengths. You've heard the phrase opposites attract, right? Well, there's certainly some truth to that. I personally cannot imagine being with someone as chatty and obnoxious as myself. My husband's quite the opposite. <laughs> Humans are constantly evaluating themselves and others across a variety of ways. Things like attractiveness, wealth, intelligence, success. We can't help it. You know something that I do? When I walk into a room... And I, a room full of strangers, and I'm looking around at people. I look at a person's left hand. And in the United States, we wear our wedding bands on our left hand. So I look at a person's left hand to see if they're married. I do this for men and women. I don't know why. I look at their face, then I look at their left hand. And it's not like I'm on the prowl trying to, you know, meet anybody else. It's just what I do. I look at the face, and then I look at the hand. This is my way, my subconscious quick way of sizing people up. And when it comes to the technology world, even professionals, they size each other up 
So we try not to look bad. People worry that someone's going to bump their ideas off that proverbial pedestal. This is why sometimes stakeholders tell you, oh, I know what the user wants. Let me just tell you so that you don't talk to them directly. Or this is why salespeople don't let you have access to customers so you can't chat with them yourself. That's not very agile, not being able to talk to customers, is it? And this is why some leaders or product owners don't want you to test early concepts or designs and then iterate on that process. They say, oh, we'll just get the feedback when it's released to the people. Mm, not good. So what can you do to prevent social comparison bias? Well, when we hire people for our teams, we need to think about the diversity of people. Diversity and inclusion is a very hot topic these days and for good reason. Look for people from different races, religions, cultures, backgrounds, locations to bring in that diverse perspective to our products. Think about what's happening in Silicon Valley and San Francisco and all those kind of tech bubbles, those tech hubs, and how they're not really providing a diverse perspective because they all live in that little tech bubble. By doing so, in other words, by including diverse perspectives, we're simply going to make better products. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about things that don't agree with our mental models or our ideas. I have another fancy word for you. Are you ready? The Semmelweis effect. I'm going to say that again. The Semmelweis effect. And this is the tendency to reject new evidence that contradicts the paradigm and what people already believe is true. So the term originated from the story of Ignaz Semmelweis, a doctor who discovered that, wait for this, mortality or death rates fell 10 times when doctors washed their hands in between patients and most particularly after an autopsy and then going to a live patient. It's pretty shocking, huh? <laughs> sure. Washing your hands in between sick or even dead patients seems like a no-brainer today. But Semmelweis, his hand-washing suggestions were rejected by his doctor peers. Mm, I guess that every new process has to start sometime. So how does this cognitive bias relate to the non-medical world? Well, as we've seen in previous examples, people already think they know what's best, and it's hard to convince them that they're wrong. Old paradigms are stubborn and difficult to break. For some here at the conference, a long, long time ago, this might have been the way for you to check your email or to get on the internet or to do work. For those who don't know what this is, this is an old Apple computer. And then Steve Jobs came by and he decided that we all needed to access this kind of stuff on our phone. Yes, our phone. But this concept had been tried before and failed. This is a picture of a Palm Pilot, which is an early personal digital assistant. In fact, other items have been created way before the iPhone, but were not successful. Why is that? Well, perhaps people in the world were just not ready for it yet. Well, let me say some people in the world were not ready yet. And that's where the Semmelweis effect kicks in. People are creatures of habit and we don't like change. But in order for things to be modern and progress and be new, we have to challenge the status quo. We have to be accepting of innovation opportunities. So think about what might be your Semmelweis hand-washing moment. Okay, so have you ever had someone come up with a problem to solve and you wonder how the competition is tackling that same problem? It's pretty natural to wonder how other companies are solving the same issues, right? Well, maybe not always. The not invented here is a cognitive bias 
where people don't want to accept information or ideas developed outside of their group. It's the classic, oh, we don't need to know what that group is doing because we're pro it's probably not as good as our idea. Ugh. Ooh, this is really frustrating for me. As a researcher and a designer, my first reaction when I hear about a new problem to solve is to figure out what already exists in the world. Why reinvent the wheel? When, when you look at what a competitor is doing, this is known as competitive benchmarking or competitive analysis. We look at other products to see what they're doing better and are there good features that we might want to take from that. Or we look at their products and see what they, they suck at. And then we make sure that, that we don't use those parts of their product. So think for a second, can you recall a time that you had a stakeholder or someone on your team tell you that there was no need to go check out the competition? I'm guessing yes, I certainly have had this. Well, that person is suffering from the not invented here bias. So why does this even happen? Well, there's a number of reasons that can contribute to the not invented here bias. But basically the whole idea of this not invented here bias really stems, in my opinion, from insecurity. When I'm first assigned to a new product to research or design, I love to start with comparing similar products. Again, partially to see what's out there and take the good stuff. And I encourage you to do to do the same. So you're so you're avoiding the not invented here bias. And there's simply no need to reinvent the wheel. So it's pretty common knowledge that people are social beings. Even the introverts here at the conference, and I know that there's some of you here today, even the introverts seek some interaction from time to time. So this next cognitive bias I'm gonna talk about is going to focus on some of the things that we do as humans to fit in with the group. We use an expression in America, bite your tongue. And are you familiar maybe with that phrase? Um, and I don't mean, when I say bite your tongue, I don't mean eating food. <laughs> uh, I mean that you want to say something in a group setting, but you're afraid that your opinion will be too different than everyone else's. So you don't say anything. And the courtesy bias is to not fully state your opinion once someone else's opinion has already been shared with the group. Even if we don't agree, we don't say anything because we don't want to offend others or we don't want to look bad in front of the group. I get it. It makes sense that you might not want to speak your true thoughts in front of others. You don't want to be embarrassed by saying the wrong thing. But like it or not, we are social beings and we want to fit in. We do this sometimes by keeping our mouth shut until we feel safe to speak. So how do we exhibit this courtesy bias? Well, we simply wait for someone else to speak first before we say anything. Have you ever been on like a group meeting? Maybe it's a video call, maybe it's in person and no one speaks after the presenter asks a question. Everyone seems to wait there in awkward silence for feels like forever. Well, that's one of the reasons for this pause other than maybe you don't have an answer, is that people are afraid to be the first one to speak. Again, they don't want to seem foolish or say the wrong thing in front of the group. So I have a great way to com combat or resist courtesy bias in a brainstorming session. And by that, I mean, you're a group of people either standing around a whiteboard with a marker and a list of post-it notes, or maybe you're doing it on a virtual whiteboard these days. So this process I'm gonna talk about also helps those introverts who don't feel comfortable speaking in a group setting. Okay, so first, when you're having a group brainstorming session, you need to create a comfortable environment for contradictions. So you lay down some ground rules. All ideas are welcome. We're not shooting any ideas down. Quantity over quality. No analysis yet. You know, those kinds of rules. 
And then after you lay down the rules, you go through this process. You have everyone write down their ideas in however time you give them, two to five minutes, say. You have everyone write ideas down in silence. And then you have them put the post-it notes and the stickies on the wall or in the virtual whiteboard in silence. Then once everybody has put all their ideas out there, that's when you can, can start discussing things as a group. And by giving the group the opportunity to generate ideas in silence, you're giving all people a chance to write their true thoughts. And they're not going to be distracted by what others are saying. And so the benefit of coming up with ideas in silence is that it really levels the playing field. You give people the opportunity who normally don't feel comfortable talking in a group the chance to get their thoughts out. And they can do this before all the chatty people start talking. <laughs> I point at myself as being somebody who's chatty, so I know how that feels. So I feel like this is a really important first step that of any idea generating process. And also, it's a great way to avoid the courtesy bias among the group, isn't it? All right, so let's talk about how our perceptions have been influenced by things we have seen very recently, as opposed to those things we've seen a long time ago. And the first one I'd like to talk about is the Bader-Meinhof effect. And yep, that's a big word, so I'm going to say it again. The Bader-Meinhof effect. And so that is no, also known as the frequency illusion. And it is the cognitive bias that happens when something that has recently come to your attention suddenly seems to appear everywhere. So have you seen a famous person talked about in the news and then it feels like you're seeing them all over the place and Twitter and Insta and TikTok and on the news and they're everywhere. How about this person who says global warming must be true because every day this spring has been hotter than last year? Well, to be honest, we're not all the way through spring yet. So how can this be true? So why does this happen? Remember, the brain has to quickly make sense of things. It can't help it. Some of you probably see three circles here, right? Uh, you see a red one, a green one, and a purple blue one. Well, these, le these circles are actually made of like little leaves or long ovals. And what our mind does is it makes patterns out of those for us and makes them into circles. The brain seeks things it's comfortable with and latches on to those. Thus, they ignore things that are not familiar. So when a pattern or a name rings true to us, our brain latches on to that. And as a result, we think we see or hear that more than we actually do. So here's an example from the real world. Say you're interested in buying a green sweater. I know it's spring and it's going to be hot soon, but you want to get ready for fall. So you think about, I'm going to get a green sweater. Well, then you suddenly see everybody else has a green sweater. Or do you? So when someone makes the claim, this happens all the time, or all of our customers do this, I want you to think about that and take that grain, uh, take that claim with a grain of salt. My main point about the Bader-Meinhof effect is recognize that trends might not actually be as frequent as the person is stating. Some of it might just be in their mind. So have you ever seen a person scream on a scary ride and just like scream the entire time? Screaming in sheer terror like they're being murdered. But when they get off the ride, they're super excited, they're overjoyed and ecstatic and ready to hop on that ride again. Anybody ever seen that? I know I certainly have. Well, what this is, is known as the peak end rule. So people judge an experience largely based on how they feel at the peak of the experience or at the end of that experience. So in the case of this ride, 
the person's probably feeling pretty relieved that the ride's being no it, that the ride's over <laughs> they, and they survived it rather than the two minutes of terror that they had just been through when they were riding the ride. The ride is over. They lived. They feel happy. Therefore, that's the peak experience emotion that they have for the whole experience. So let me um, illustrate the illustrate the peak end rule with another story. My husband and I were in a restaurant where um, the menu is on an iPad or a tablet. It's not there's not paper menus, and um, I was watching him order a meal on that uh, iPad in a restaurant because I was doing some research on a product. So he has a gluten free diet. Uh, he can't have things with wheat in it. So he needs to order special food like a gluten-free bun or gluten-free pizza crust. And he has a few other dietary restrictions he has to be aware of before he can order. So I'm watching him navigate this menu and he's, he's struggling a bit. He's clicking all over the place. He's hunting, he's pecking, he's searching. Oh, he griped, he complained, he huffed. <laughs> it was actually kind of fun to watch, but that, you know. <laughs> but eventually he found the gluten free bun for his hamburger. And so then he placed his order. And after ordering, he said, Well, pff, that was totally easy. He'd already forgotten all the pain he had been through hunting, pecking, searching. For him, the peak of the experience was finishing the task and being done. And that was positive for him. And therefore, the whole experience was positive. So as we learned about the peak end rule, I want to take this opportunity to kind of talk about the importance of one of my favorite types of user research, which is ethnographic observation, or sometimes called side-by-sides. And Ethnographic observation is when you're with a person and you observe what they do in their natural environment. So sometimes, sometimes it could be like you're at work with them and you're seeing them sit at their desk and you see how they interact with their computer, what their environment's set up like, what cheat sheets they have. Or you, as you can see from these photos, I was in um, on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles where I was doing some research on a product and I was observing people who were tourists and, and I was observing them and I was talking to them to understand how they were figuring out what attractions were in the area and how they were going to visit these attractions. So the point here is that as you're watching them go through the activity and picking up on the clues that you would only see in person, uh, they're likely to report things differently after the fact than what really happened. They might not tell you about their struggles or what they, their pain points were, but if you're there, you can see them firsthand. So why is ethnographic research so important? Well, like my story with my husband who was ordering gluten-free food, you can't always take a person by what they say, but you can take a person by what they do. So. I know a lot of today's talk has been focusing on the negative aspects of cognitive bias, and that's because they're pretty bad overall. Uh, but I want you to be aware of these fallacies because you can be better engineers and developers and product partners by having some understanding about them. But you can also use the traits of some cognitive biases in a good way. And so note that we're not going to have any dark patterns here, folks. We're going to use these cognitive biases for good. Remember how I talked about the Bader-Meinhof effect or the frequency illusion effect? Again, that's the cognitive bias that happens when something that has recently come into our attention suddenly appears everywhere. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You can use this comfort and familiarity to guide the user or the customer through a journey more smoothly. You can repeat elements, especially in an omni-channel experience. Jennifer, and when I say omni-channel, omni that's when a person might interact <laughs> with your product 
across yes, yes. multiple touch points. Let's say they're shopping for something and they start shopping on their home computer or work computer. And then they go into the store and they're looking around in the store and then maybe they pull up their cell phone and either pull up the app or pull up a website to get some more information. This is an omni-channel experience. And as someone creating and building products, you can use familiar clues like color, fonts, common design patterns to make the user feel comfortable where they are. And this helps them feel familiar in the experience. They know that they're in the right place, in the right experience. So I want you to think for a minute, has anyone here ever assembled a piece of furniture you bought from Ikea? Think about how that made you feel to do that. Were you frustrated? Were, did you feel accomplished, satisfied when you got it done? I know I feel like a champion when I put something together from Ikea. I am the person in our household who assembles Ikea furniture and I love it. I have to admit though, I've had some furniture that looks a little more like this. <laughs> Whether you love it or hate it, there is a cognitive bias associated with the famous Swedish furniture store, Ikea. So the Ikea effect is for tendency to people to place high value on objects that they partially assemble themselves, just like furniture from Ikea. And they're proud of this, even regardless of the quality or the end result. So why is this even a thing? Well, people have an emotional investment when they build something from their own blood, sweat, tears, and hands. So, okay, get it. So how does this IKEA effect apply to products and maybe app design, what we might be working on in the technology world? Well, a user can experience that same effect when they complete a task, like maybe assembling a puzzle or getting some work done. They feel a stronger emotional connection when they complete it successfully. So consider this feeling when you build an interface or a product that could perhaps give somebody a taste of delight after their success. So I'm kind of hoping that maybe you found a couple of things that I talked about today a little bit funny. All right, give me a break, okay? I tried to inject some humor along the way. And I've done that because I know that humorous items are more easily remembered than non-humorous ones. And this is known as the humor effect. So this is an easy one, right? We've all seen something funny on the internet. I really love this 404 page. <laughs> it really cracks me up. You get to choose the developer who gets fired for this error message coming up. Now this is, you know, this is fun. I'm sure they don't get really fired, but this is a fun error message, right? Um, this is a good example of using the cognitive bias called the humor effect. So when your company shows something funny, it allows users to connect with your company or your product in a more personal and emotional level. Humor feels conversational or relatable, and it gives your side or product a human connection. Okay, so how can you inject some humor in the app or whatever you're building? Well, first you need to decide how you're going to do it. Is it going to be words, illustrations, animation? You can see here we have a couple, right? We have words, oops, and we have a fun illustration. But I do have a little caveat when it comes to humor. Make sure that is it appropriate for your audience and it represents the message your company wants to send. We do not want to be inappropriate. Remember, we're trying to use these cognitive biases for good, right? So let's move on to another cognitive bias that could be used to benefit your designs and the things that you're building. Just take a look at this image for a second. Ooh, I can't look at this image too long. It's got a lot going on. It's got a lot of crazy going on here. <laughs> for those who are maybe not familiar with who this person is, this is most of the people here are Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ooh. So in a world where everyone seems to be trying to one-up the next person or be better than the next person, they are there are ways that we're trying to be more creative and extreme 
to capture people's limited attention. And that means that bizarre material, like what we're looking at here, is better remembered than common or bland material. And this is where the bizarreness effect comes in. This is part of the reason why humans have peripheral vision. We notice things on the move. And in many cases, we notice things that are different. So this seems like a pretty simple cognitive bias that we could use for good in design. We should just make everything shocking, right? Ooh, well, not exactly. <laughs> the whole point here is that you want your website or whatever you're building to stand out in a sea of sameness. I get that. But you also don't want to be obnoxious and annoying. So you can use design elements like color and contrast, emphasis to make something stand out. This is why you see a button on a page looks different than the other items on the page. You could even use animation to draw attention to something. And finally, like I mentioned before, you can use humor, like a fun illustration, to play into this bizarreness effect. The key here is to balance pleasantly surprised with obnoxious as heck. And finally, I'm going to wrap up with the ways that you can use cognitive biases for good with a very important one that we often take for granted. And if you do nothing else in the universe as a developer or a person who's making stuff, please do this one thing. Make good defaults. Like this nice, tidy room here. When a person comes to your website or your app or whatever you're building for the first time, have things set up for them nice and tidy. The default effect happens when we're given a set of options, we assume the default options are the best ones. We expect good things to be chosen for us. And we don't want to have to set anything up ourselves. So say, for example, when you install a new app on your phone, you might assume push notifications are turned off automatically. If not, you find out the hard way that they're actually turned on as, by default because you are bombarded with useless messages. I have been there. That's not fun. So the person who uses a website or product assumes the expert or at the very least, the creator or the developer of this app or product has vetted out the best design decisions and set them up. And that's what is automatically set in motion for them when they sign up. So when given a choice between several options, we have the tendency to favor the default one. Humans are lazy. Tell us, human beings, what the best selection is. Like the famous words of Steve Krug, the writer, don't make me think. So how do you design a product or experience to, to promote good defaults? Well, part of it is to keep the marketing and the sales department out of the designing a feature business. So let's be honest. Sometimes sales, they often want to plug the things into an app or a product for a different agenda than the user actually wants. Don't let them throw into a, a bunch of features in that users don't really need. Sometimes they contribute to feature bloat. All right, really though, a, a practical way that you can design good defaults is to conduct user research to understand how the person normally uses your product and then align the defaults to that. So how is this done in design? Well, you can use color, fonts, and group like items together to emphasize the best option. Packaging items in a visual way will give the user confidence that you're presenting the best choice to them. That is, of course, if you are presenting the best choice to them. Remember, we're going to do good in our designs. We're going to use these cognitive biases for good, right? <laughs> So to conclude, I want to revisit a couple of the major points I talked about today. We talked about how biases affect everyone and like the blind spot bias. And I talked about how 
to be careful when you're acting as a person who's talking to others to get feedback, to try not to lead the witness. I talked about the need to avoid things like the Semmelweis effect and to be open to different and outside ideas. We also discussed our human need to fit in with the group, with the cognitive bias, like the courtesy bias. And we also talked about how our memory can be skewed. And we think we see something recently, like in the Bader-Meinhof effect. And now it's making us think we see something all of the time. And then finally, we talked about some ways to turn that frown upside down and use cognitive biases for good in our designs. Now, these things we talked about today are just the tip of the iceberg of how many cognitive biases are out there. But I think we hit some of the major ones that you can take away with you today. My main point here is to make you aware that they exist and for you to look for signs for them in yourself and more fun to look for signs of cognitive biases in others and hopefully keep them out of your future designs and your discussions. I want you to go out there and design better products without bias. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Here are some links and places that you can connect to me on social media and whatnot. Again, thank you for your time. My name is Jen Blatz. I'm a user experience researcher and designer, and I would love to connect. Have a great day. See ya. Yeah, and that talk definitely didn't suffer from the uh, too, uh, too few meaning bias, <laughs> <laughs> right? It was really great talk. And I need to process that. That, that was a lot of information. Wow. Yeah. Right. And we are very happy to have uh, Jen connected to us uh, from live from Dallas. Uh, hi. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Hello. So we have a lot of questions, but uh, probably the questions come during the next day. So maybe we need to call you again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> one question I had was, uh, I, I guess that um, some people are actually aware of some kind of bias, but, uh, but happen to actively ignore it. Uh, what do you think? Why could that happen? Well, that's a very good question. I do think that a lot of biases are unconscious. So I don't think that they are aware of them. And that's kind of how they work, right? They happen. Our mind processes things in certain ways. And we're not even aware of that. But for those who, I don't even, I don't think it's a bias at that point. In a sense, it's almost like a personality flaw. Yeah. If you choose to ignore <laughs> some of the, some of the uh, traits that help you communicate better with others and uh, work with others, then I think there's a little bit more going on there than a bias. <laughs> and well, I, I, I've got the impression that um, at least in the tech scene or maybe even in the, in the broader uh, world, that their um, interest in these kind of biases is more recent, like throughout the last uh, couple of years. So is that just my my impression or is that a recent development for some reason well robert i think that you're suffering from the bader meinhof effect yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> I, is I, I, something know. that comes into your consciousness is now feeling like it's everywhere so I congratulations <laughs> you have just exposed one of the cognitive biases that you are suffering yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so something, for example, I definitely not not only me, but definitely me have uh, suffered from is uh, the not not invented here bias, right? And uh, this is at least one thing I often ask myself about: wha what is it for? You know, because I felt like it was there for a reason. Um, and and how how do I deal with that? And I think uh, most of the time uh, I found in the roots like it it was not really bad intentions. It was more like uh, maybe I find a better solution uh, if I I would have invented it and just put that tiny thing on top. So uh, <laughs> my 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 strategy to deal with that is like when I try to 
see that that I try to first understand if I uh, the the thing at hand you know so if I feel like it's not invented here maybe I I didn't understand it well enough so uh, would that be a strategy to deal with it yeah that's a very fair point and that's one of the main reasons why I included that bias into this mm. talk is because <laughs> I've seen this bias in a lot of places uh, one way to do that is just to understand what the competition is doing and and it's okay to see what they're doing and to do it better that happens all the time we're always making increment improvements upon something else or something within our company so that's that's totally normal that's how we progress mm. and make technology better and faster and make better products so it's it's okay but it's all you know just be aware that sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It kind of becomes that, do we need to have, thir is third-party software okay to solve this solution or do we need to build it ourselves? And to weigh the po pros and cons of, if we build it ourselves, what are the costs and the resources that are gonna go into that, right? So just looking at it as a bigger picture, uh, maybe not thinking about, oh, I can make the best thing and it's gonna be pretty and sexy and cool, <laughs> But like, what's it really going to take to build this, and and be realistic about what the what those efforts are? Yeah. <laughs> when 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 I think about um, this uh, not invented here syndrome, I have this uh, XKCD comic in mind. Um, this the stick figure. What's his name? Yeah. Ren, Ren, is it Randall Munro? I, I'm not sure. Um, and he he has this comic where he says. Uh, Oh, I'm I'm going to write a JavaScript framework that does everything perfectly, and then we we end up with one more JavaScript framework like like all the time, right? <laughs> um, so don't do that with your new React skills, Robert. Um, yeah, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess another yeah. yeah, sorry. No, you're right. I mean, that's why large companies have multiple calendar pickers or multiple products that do the same thing, is because they're not investigating to figure out what's also being built in other departments or other silos. Yeah, and I think uh, knowing about uh, cognitive biases is also important in order to detect when you're getting into the field of uh, using dark patterns, you know. That is something I'm also concerned about really in uh, also in our industry that um, developers are kind of just doing what they are being told and don't question so much if, if that is really doing something harmful and, and actively misusing uh, cognitive patterns. So I, I tried to find a photo, but I didn't. Uh, I found even a, sh a, a shower um, a shampoo and it said something like six in one, right? <laughs> and now guess what was the six in one and it was definitely it was not only head and 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 so on but it was left arm right arm <laughs> <laughs> left leg <laughs> right leg you know <laughs> in fine print <laughs> below um, but what would you suggest uh, to someone who feels like oh that that's getting into the direction of having to implement a dark pattern how could you how could you react on it yeah, that's, a v that's great to talk about because that's why at that section at the end I talk about there are cognitive biases that you can use for good and I'm very scolding and I say, but you're not going to make dark patterns. <laughs> but my advice would be developers are very smart people and I want their voice to be heard as well. Speak up. If you know this is not right, if you know that this could harm the user and it doesn't have to be in a huge way, but if it, this is unethical and harmful, please speak up and, and voice your concern that this might not be the best experience. This might not be the way that our company wants to promote itself. We may not, because those can have reper repercussions. If uh, you do some negative things, customers will report that on a very public platform. And that's a difficult thing to correct and retract once it's out there. Yeah. I have done it myself. <laughs> So yeah. I will complain publicly about companies if they do something negative or if I have a poor experience. And so it can have more of a broader impact. And so to your question, Robert, yes, just speak up. You know it's wrong. You are a smart person. You're hired to be there for a reason because you're a smart person and your voice does matter and, and 
voice your concerns. Yeah, if in, if in doubt, you can still ask your colleague, that sounds really bad, what do you think, right? Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> test, test your concern. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, Test your design, test your concern. That's good. And uh, you mentioned something that, uh, that I very much liked, um, Jennifer. Um, you have a gut feeling about this. Um, all these biases are, you know, c your brain is doing something that's cognitive, um, but your heart feels something as well. And, you know, when, you, when it feels fishy, when it feels w wrong, speak up, um, talk to someone, um, see if they feel the same thing, if they share your, you know, um, in, you, you know, the thing you're feeling, um, that's, that's a good advice. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole point of this talk is to, to, to be aware, like to what Robert was saying, like, oh, I feel like I'm seeing cognitive biases everywhere. Well, there's a, <laughs> that's called a thing that that's got a name. And now you know that that's a thing to look out for. And that's the whole point of what I'm trying to do with sharing some of these biases is now, you know, the uh, don't look outside, you know, not invented here bias. Now you can see the signs and be like, whoa, wait a minute. I see what's happening here and kind of halt some of these things from getting too far along. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for teaching us pareidolia <laughs> and uh, <laughs> taking the time. You said to it right. <laughs> <Yeah. Hey. laughs> so thanks a lot and uh, greetings to you, to Dallas. Yes. Um, yeah, thank take you. care and see you in, in the real world at some point, hopefully, right? Absolutely. Thank you all for letting me be part of this uh, great conference and uh, have this chat at the end. And and uh, don't use cognitive biases for bad. <laughs> <laughs> we decide what's good. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day.